Hello, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started on today's topic, which is all about ocean circulation, uh, which really means we're going to talk about how water moves throughout our globe. I'm really excited to be offering our sixth webinar um, over the past two weeks. And if you haven't joined us yet, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about who we are. Um, OPAC stands for Ocean Protection Advocacy Kids. Um, and we are headquartered out of Plymouth, Massachusetts. Uh, we are a nonprofit that teaches marine science, art, and advocacy workshops in grades K through 12, pretty much just in Massachusetts, but we have traveled around New England as well. And we're really excited to be able to offer these webinars, and we hope that they will help you uh, continue to learn virtually. So today we're going to be looking at ocean currents, we're going to investigate the Coriolis effect, we're going to discover um, how we actually measure ocean currents, we're going to learn about upwelling and downwelling uh, in our ocean, which is the vertical movement of water. We're going to talk about how rubber ducts are involved in ocean currents, and then we're actually going to talk about the probability of the film the day after tomorrow. And then at the end of this uh, webinar, we will have a time for you to ask questions. So please stick around. If you do have a question during the webinar, please write it down. Um, just use the chat function for, for questions at the end and I will be more than happy to answer those. If you have to leave early and you have a question, please send us an email. And thank you again for joining. So I'm gonna start this off with uh, what are ocean currents? So currents are masses of ocean water that go from one place to another. And when we talk about currents, we're really talking about energy flow and a lot of energy that move currents is from wind and the sun. And a lot of the deep ocean currents are driven by density, but think of a current as just a water mass that's in motion versus um, a tide, which is not a current. A tide is the raising and lowering of our sea level over um, periodic times, depending on where you are in, on the planet. And those are controlled by gravity versus our currents, which are driven by solar and wind and density. Uh, currents actually do move about a third of the planet's total heat. Uh, the other two thirds are driven by wind. And also waves are a little different than currents and tides as well. Waves are energy that are moving just at the, um, exchange of our ocean and our atmosphere, so the air-sea interface. So most of our currents that we think of, so the part, if we were at the beach and we were looking at the, the water moving, those are driven by wind, and we call those our surface currents. And these actually only go about a kilometer deep in the ocean. And if you've joined us in the past, you might remember that on average, the ocean is about two and a, between two and two and a half miles deep on average throughout the globe. So these currents, these wind-driven currents are only going on the top layer about half a mile down and they're only impacting around 10% of ocean water. Um, these currents, um, they are wind-driven but only about 2% of the wind's energy is transferred to the current itself. And a good way to think about this is if you had uh, a cup in front of you and you were to blow on top of the water, um, you could blow really, really hard and you might only get the water to move a little bit. So only about 2% of our wind energy is transferred to our surface current energy. And this is a frictional force. So they are rubbing together. 
Um, if we, and if you go back and you look at the, the globe that's here, uh, you can see that these are kind of forming around the continents. The continents are getting in the way of our currents. If you're looking at the arrows here, if we didn't have continents, our wind, um, our currents would follow the wind patterns that we have on our globe. And on each hemisphere, we have three big cells of wind. Um, you can see them there, the Hadley cell, the Ferro cell, and the polar cell. So if we didn't have continents on our planet, we would have three big circles of wind-driven currents on our ocean. But because we have continents in the way, those get impacted um, a little bit differently. Um, another big factor that drives the movement of our water is called the Coriolis effect. And this is the bending of Earth's winds and currents due to the fact that the Earth is spinning. Um, so in the Northern hemisphere, winds and currents are pushed to the right. Um, so we have a clockwise flow of water and wind. And in the Southern hemisphere, our winds and currents are pushed to the left. So they have a counterclockwise flow. And a good way to think about this is if you had like a paper airplane and you had the power to throw it really far distance uh, and you were standing wherever you are and you wanted to send it due north about 200 miles, it wouldn't actually go straight. Um, it would get diverted off. And you can see that on the figure on the right here. Um, so if you've been on an airplane or on a really long boat ride, uh, the pilots and the captains actually compute something called a great circle route. And that's because uh, we don't travel in the straight line that we want to go uh, when we're dealing with wind and ocean current because of this thing called the Coriolis effect. Again, this is bending the travel of our intended path. And here in the Northern hemisphere, we are being pushed to the right. And in the Southern hemisphere, we're being pushed to the left. And this constant pushing of our currents actually creates hills in our ocean. Um, and when I say hill, it's really just a little bump, uh, no more than about two meters around our planet. Um, but we have this constantly circling uh, current from the wind, from this Coriolis effect. And if you've twirled something, um, you get a vortex, but we're getting the opposite here because of the winds and the uh, forces that our currents are pushing through. And this creates a, a bump in the middle of the ocean. And we're gonna get back to this in a little bit, but that bump actually speeds up and slows down parts of our ocean flow on the surface. And you can see this through some satellite images um, that we relatively have higher parts of the ocean and lower parts of the ocean. So think of it, like climbing up a mountain, but this mountain is just a little tiny bump when we're talking about centimeters instead of uh, feet or miles or kilometers. It's a small hill, but it's important with, for how our oceans circulate. And these circular motions are called gyres. Um, so we get the Coriolis effect that's pushing our currents to the right, creating clockwise in the Northern hemisphere and currents to the left creating counterclockwise in the Southern Hemisphere. And you can see the, the circular motion of our surface currents here. And when we have them on the larger scale, we're calling those gyres. Um, when we have a gyre, uh, because of the, um, the Coriolis effect in those little hills I was just mentioning, we get something called Western intensification um, of our currents. So we have two boundary currents, if you think about our globe here, you have the eastern end. So if we're looking at the Atlantic Ocean, we have the Canary Current. And if we're looking at the western part of the Atlantic Ocean, we have the Gulf Stream. Uh, so we have those two currents. We have the western boundary current, so our Gulf Stream. These are really fast currents. Um, if you think about like Finding Nemo, that's in a really fast current uh, when the, they're riding the sea turtles. Uh, and then we have our eastern boundary currents, which are very slow moving wide currents that move much less water than the western um, boundary currents, which are our fast, deep 
currents moving lots and lots of water. Um, another part of this fast movement from our wind uh, is through something called the Ekman spiral or transport. Um, and believe it or not, if the wind is blowing due north, the surface current, so where the water is moving because of the frictional force is actually gonna be about 20 to 45 degrees to the right, um, 45 degrees in an ideal world, but uh, we never really have an ideal world in the ocean. Things are constantly changing. Um, and as you move down in the water column, uh, that keeps happening. So at some given point, you could actually have a, the wind direction going due north and a current moving completely in the opposite direction, so due south below you. Um, and that creates a net water transport to the right um, of 90 degrees in an ideal world. This was first observed um, around 1900 when people were in the Arctic and saw icebergs moving in a different direction than the wind was blowing. Um, and then as time went on, people were able to measure this occurrence um, through the water column. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how we measure currents in a moment. Um, but this, uh, this force isn't very strong. It does slowly lose its velocity as it goes deeper and deeper. And it has really only been observed to about a hundred meters and it's, it is not very strong. So oftentimes people ask, can this spiral disturb ship traffic? And the answer is, is no. Um, it's not a very strong force, but it is something that is important for things like plankton that are constantly going with the flow um, or our plastics now that are in the ocean. Uh, so there are a few different ways that we can measure these surface currents. Um, and these are how we have found things like the Ekman spiral and our gyres. Um, we can just put a drifting or floating device in the water. So uh, something like this drift current meter here, or just a buoy and attach a radio signal to it so that we can track it as it moves through the ocean. Uh, and then we have current measuring devices. Uh, so this is really looking at the speed of a current. And these have little propellers on them. So think of like a really mini submarine and we can drag these behind a boat. We can leave them at a dock. Uh, we can put them in a river and we can measure how fast the water's moving by measuring the rate of that propellers turning. Um, think of like a wind turbine, but in a really small version. And then we have some indirect methods that we can measure as well. Um, water flow is parallel to pressure gradients and don't wanna go into the deep science of this, but um, basically we can look at the pressure gradient and then, um, or we can find the pressure gradient and then try and track the current from that. Uh, we can actually look at currents from satellites by measuring that the changes in the height of our water that we I just mentioned before. So those little hills um, and those little hills create flow and we can see that from satellite images. And we can also use um, Doppler radar like we would for measuring our wind um, by just sending a frequency into the water and then seeing how that changes as it comes back to us once that sound is bounced back. Um, so the, this is one example of someone that has measured some of those flow rates. Um, and we measure flow rate through something called a spedrip, uh, which is one of the scientists that helped this theory. Um, and the numbers that you see on this chart here uh, in the white circles, those are how many spedrips are in that specific current. And this again shows you that Western intensification of our gyres. So in the Gulf Stream, you see much higher numbers than you do in the Canary Current near Africa and Europe. Um, so our water is moving much faster. And when we look at this, oh, sorry, I thought I had. When we, I have an image for you later and you can see this um, a little bit better from the satellite image. Um, oh, never mind. I will show it to you again later. Uh, but we can see this through satellite imagery. Um, so we have our surface currents that we're talking about, but that was only 10% of 
our ocean, most of our currents are actually driven by density. So if you joined us on Tuesday, we talked about ocean chemistry. And one of the big drivers for ocean density is water temperature and in part salinity as well. Um, so we increase seawater density. Um, and it, sorry, we have an increase in seawater density by a decrease in temperature and, or by an increase in salinity. Um, but temperature is a much bigger influence on water density than salinity does, um, except in our polar regions. Um, and these changes in density, we, um, we call that a picnicline. It's the density gradient in our ocean. So where all of a sudden our density changes on a more rapid scale. Um, and very small changes in density create water to sink or rise, um, fractions of change. And these deep water currents influence about 90% of our ocean water versus 10% of our uh, wind-driven currents at the surface. Um, however, these currents move much, much slower, um, but they do move much larger volumes of water. So again, we have 90% versus 10%. Uh, so much water that they are about 100 times the flow of the Amazon River, and they're speed is usually 10 to 20 kilometers per year. So about 10 miles per, per year, they are moving at a very slow rate. Uh, it takes a deep sea current an entire year to travel as far as the Gulf Stream would. One of those Western intensified currents does in an hour. Um, so we have all this water. It's very cold, it's deep, and it's moving very slowly. Um, and when these density driven currents are moving all across our globe, and we call these the global conveyor belt, um, which is also called thermohaline circulation, which comes from thermo being temperature and haline being salinity. Um, and you can see that our waters travel, warm waters on the surface travel to the polar regions. They get really cold, which means they get more dense, they sink down the deep depths of our ocean. And then they continue to move at a much slower rate as they travel eventually through the entire planet. I'm gonna let this finish here for you. Um, but you can see now we're moving south through the Atlantic Ocean to the Southern Atlantic. And these are the same waters. They're very deep depths, um, picking up lots of oxygen, moving very, very slowly. Um, and at some points they can come up and you can see that here in the Southern Ocean, but eventually this water makes it all the way back to the Atlantic Ocean after it travels through the Pacific. Um, I have linked this video as well as another video of this global conveyor belt to our resources page. Um, and I have an activity for you where you can study this a little bit further and uh, map out this conveyor belt and where our surface currents and our deep water currents are in the ocean. So I do have a little poll question for you. Uh, let me pop this up here and this first question. So I want to ask you how long do you think it takes for water to travel around the globe via the global conveyor belt? So these deep water currents, anywhere from zero to a thousand years are your options going by hundred year segments. I will give you another 15 seconds to answer this question. Five seconds. How long does it take to travel around the world via the global conveyor belt? So our answers are very scattered with the most being at between 100 and 200 years and between 900 and 1,000 years. And the answer to this 
is about a thousand years. So it's estimated that any given volume of water that sinks down into this conveyor belt will take about a thousand years to complete that journey through the entire ocean. So to get back to its starting point, whether that's in the Arctic or Antarctic. So water from the year 1020 is now just finishing its journey across the planet, which is pretty crazy to think about. Um, which is also relevant when we talk about plastic pollution and if our plastic is getting caught in these currents, just think about how long things will last in our ocean. Um, even though we think we're getting rid of them, they can be out there for a very long time and other pollutants like radioactive material from uh, nuclear bomb tests and things can be stuck in these, these waters for quite a long time. Um, so how do we measure these deep ocean currents? We talked about how we measure things at the surface by putting buoys in, but how do you get something to sink down and stay in the ocean? Um, this is a short little video clip from a uh, movement that's done uh, called the Argo Float Program. And I'm just gonna show you how they measure the deep ocean currents. Scientists on research ships can sample the ocean only briefly. So they deploy automated devices for long-term ocean monitoring. This float is part of an international research program called Argo. It measures ocean conditions that drive events such as El Niños and climate change. Like a hot air balloon, it drifts along on slow-moving currents in the deep sea. The float dives by mechanically decreasing its volume in the water, and it descends to as far as two kilometers, more than a mile, to survey otherwise unmeasured underwater regions. Submerged for up to 10 days, the float can be programmed to stay at one depth or to move up and down to follow changing conditions. At preset intervals, it ascends by increasing its volume. Rising through many ocean layers, it records the ocean pressure, temperature, and salinity, collecting an up-to-date profile of evolving ocean conditions. At the surface, the float makes radio contact. Its new location reveals the features of underwater currents, and the data supply real-time measurements of subsurface ocean conditions, details unavailable without Argo. After a short period, the float is ready for another cycle, a process it can repeat for more than five years. With 3,000 floats in a global network, the Argo program will supply real-time ocean data for immediate use in research and operational forecasting of marine and climate conditions worldwide. Argo, observing the oceans in real time. Um, I've linked the website where this video uh, can be found, as well as many other videos about the construction of these Argo floats, as well as Argo floats that go to even deeper depths, uh, like 4,000 meters in our ocean. And again, these floats work like hot air balloons, so they're uh, controlled by pressure, and there's a lot of pressure in our ocean. And when they say they're measuring temperature and salinity, that's really helping us find that density, which drives our deep ocean currents. Um, and once you have these Argo floats in the ocean, you can start to put together figures like this here, where you can see that there are different densities um, at different levels or different depths of our ocean. And you can see that um, on this bottom figure here, we have currents that are moving in different directions stacked on top of each other in the ocean. So you have those surface currents and those warm tropical areas at the top there. And then as you move down, you have your Antarctic intermediate waters and your North Atlantic deep waters and your Antarctic bottom waters that are all moving in different directions driven by that density. Um, and when you put this together, um, this is how it would look if you were to find this in a research paper. Um, your different colors being your different temperatures, um, and those different temperatures help us define our different densities. And those, again, this is the same information that's here, just shown in a different format. Um, so we, those are our horizontal movements of our water from our surface 
wind-driven currents and our density deep water-driven currents, but we also have vertical movement of ocean water. We call that upwelling and downwelling. Upwelling is the vertical movement of our cold, nutrient-rich waters uh, that come from the deep ocean back up to the surface. This is really great for phytoplankton and primary productivity. So we get high rates of growth in upwelling zones. We get really biodiverse regions of our ocean in upwelling zones. This is pretty common in coastal areas. And then we also have the vertical uh, movement of water to the deeper parts of the ocean. So we take the very depleted nutrients nutrient water from the surface and we bring it back down to the deep ocean. And one benefit of that is that that water actually has a lot of more dissolved oxygen that can be brought down to organisms on the deep sea floor that require that to survive. Uh, so the this is kind of like your standard diagram of what upwelling looks like. So we have our surface winds that are pushing water away from an area. And again, we need to think about our Ekman spiral and our Coriolis effect when we're thinking about our surface winds. So the water is getting net transported to the right where you see this picture. And that warmer surface water is then moving away from our coast, which is allowing that colder deep water to rise up to the surface. Um, and that brings all those wonderful nutrients so that we can have our phytoplankton and our zooplankton, which will bring all the diversity with it. Uh, we do have some other sources of upwelling at the equator. We have winds that are pushing away, which creates pressure up. So our um, diverging surface waters create a pressure gradient that brings nutrients up to the surface. Uh, we have offshore winds that push warmer water out to sea, um, which is a little different than what we were looking at with the, the this would be like a westerly wind versus a northerly wind. Um, doing the same thing as the last figure, but different directions. Uh, we have seafloor obstructions, so like seamounts, underwater mountains. If you have nice cold water that hits that, it's going to be pushed up to the surface. Um, a good example of that in New England are the seamounts south of Block Island. Um, and then we have uh, sharp coastal geometry. So if you have um, a shoreline that all of a sudden veers off, um, within that little veer, you can have um, little eddies and things that create coastal upwelling on a smaller scale. And that's going to have to do with changes in the way the water is moving from our winds. Uh, so this is kind of how downwelling works. Uh, the first figure on the left is the opposite of what we saw for the upwelling. So we have winds that are pushing our warmer water towards the the land, which is then getting pushed down, um, which will bring in oxygen down to the depths for creatures that live there. And then we also have the little piles of water, those hills that are created from our gyres and our Coriolis effect. Um, and when we get water up, we're gonna get pressure that goes down and that will also bring some, create some downwelling zones in the middle of our ocean. Uh, so that's the vertical movement of our water. And when we were tracking some of the movement earlier on uh, from our ocean drifters, we also have things like rubber ducks that can help us track ocean currents. And in the, I think it was 92 or 98, my apologies um, on the year, the video will show it to us in a second. Um, there were 20, over 28,000 rubber ducks that fell off of a cargo ship and are still being found all over the world through these surface currents that are moving around. And it really helped oceanographers figure out the currents in the Pacific um, because no one would ethically just go drop all of these rubber ducks in the ocean, but they're plastic and they survive for a really long time and they've become a really good tool for us to measure these currents. I have linked the a story to a book that was written about this uh, experiment, experiments. Um, and this is just like the one minute overview of what happened uh, from the Science Channel.
January 10th, 1992, uh, a container ship traveling from Hong Kong to Tacoma, Washington, loses 12 containers overboard. One of them sets loose thousands of tiny yellow plastic ducks on the currents of the North Pacific. The currents carry the ducks all over the world. So months later, they start washing up on the coast of Alaska turning this toy spill into an accidental experiment. So from the Ducky study, you get real-time data about the currents in the North Pacific. The accidental duck experiment is still providing information today. They're almost indestructible. I mean, literally 20 years after they hit the ocean, they're still washing up on beaches around the world. All right, so I've linked um, a longer video clip as well as that story about the rubber ducks to our resources page. Um, it's a really fun way to look at ocean currents, um, even though it's an unfortunate spill, but it's a nice way to track where our surface currents are going. Um, currents also really influence or impact the, the climate that we have on land. Um, so think about all of the warm waters or cold waters that are being moved by our gyres. Um, so if you think about Spain or Portugal, on average, it's 20 degrees Fahrenheit warmer there than in New England states that are on roughly the same latitude. Um, and that is because of all of the Gulf Stream water that's being pushed over to Europe. This is also why on the East Coast of North America in February, we have about a 36 degree difference in sea surface temperature than they do on the eastern side of the North Atlantic, so the, uh, again, near Spain and Portugal. Um, so our, our sea surface currents uh, hold a lot of heat because of water vapor, and that's why we also have regions like New England that get very humid. So currents drive uh, the climate of our land masses um, pretty dramatically, and if our currents were to change, the temperature on our land mass would also change. And that gets us to what happens if the conveyor belt stops or slows down. Um, and there has been a lot of research on this and I'm not gonna read the, the whole clips here, but I have the links to these um, articles about conveyor belts stopping. Um, but basically the sequence of events that would lead to this slowdown could result in drastic temperature changes for Europe. Um, so we could lose that 20 degree difference. It could get actually a lot colder in Europe um, and a lot hotter at the poles because we wouldn't be moving all of that heat flux. And if you remember from the beginning of the presentation, our currents are moving about a third of the planet's heat. Um, so if we stop that process, we're gonna have dramatic changes in temperature, not just in Europe, but all over the world. Uh, this could have areas of Asia that don't get monsoon seasons. Uh, we could get stronger storms um, and we could get less ocean mixing. So that vertical movement of water and that could result in less primary production. So less plankton in the ocean. Um, but there is a lot of debate on if the ocean was slowing down, is that something that we are causing from climate change? or global warming, or is this something that's just a normal cycle that's happened in the past? Uh, again, there's some really good uh, papers here that I've linked to our resource page if you wanna dig down deeper into what happens if our global currents stop. And if you've heard of the film The Day After Tomorrow, it actually was looking at this idea of the North Atlantic currents stopping um, and I want to play just about a minute clip of the film that's talking about the science that they used. Um, this is not a clip that uh, we own. It's just something that I want to show you guys really quick um, because the science might be true. Ice cores is evidence of a cataclysmic climate shift which occurred around 10,000 years ago. The concentration of these natural greenhouse gases in the ice cores indicates that runaway warming pushed the planet into an ice age which lasted two centuries. I'm confused. I thought you were talking about global warming, not an ice age. Yes, it is a paradox, but global warming can trigger a cooling trend. Let me explain. 
The Northern Hemisphere owes its temperate climate to the North Atlantic Current. Heat from the sun arrives at the equator and is carried north by the ocean. But global warming is melting the polar ice caps and disrupting this flow. Eventually, it will shut down. And when that occurs, there goes our warm climate. Excuse me, uh, when do you think this could happen, Professor? When? I don't know. Maybe in a hundred years, maybe in a thousand. But what I do know is that if we do not act soon, it is our children and our grandchildren who will have to pay the price. So, could the day after tomorrow really happen? Um, probably not. Uh, but however, as you've heard, the science that they used uh, that created the dramatic effects that happened in the movie uh, were based on a scientific principle of our global conveyor belt slowing down or completely stopping. Um, and there is a huge amount of heat that is tr uh, caught in this uh, Atlantic circulation. Um, and you can see that again here, the figure on the left is our global conveyor belt. And the figure on the right is just looking at the conveyor belt on a, a vertical view. Um, so we can see the current stacking up on each other again. So if this whole system were to slow down or stop, uh, it could again create dramatic changes in temperature and weather, but it wouldn't happen on a time scale that was happening in the day after tomorrow, and it wouldn't happen probably quite that dramatic as well. Um, and the paper from Yale Environment 360 goes into the a little bit more of the science and the, the speed of which this circulation could stop and whether it's happened in the past or not before. Just want to quickly show you some of the follow-up activities and then we'll have time for a, a Q&A. Uh, there's a really great circulation game that NASA has put together that I've linked um, on our website. I also have a worksheet for you to study those surface currents and deep water currents a little bit further um, and just sketch those out so you can um, learn where they are and how fast they're moving and which ones are cold and which ones are warm. It's still encouraging everyone to make some ocean art at home and submit it to these wonderful art contests from the Massachusetts Marine Educators and South Seed Awareness Program. Um, and the, sorry if I get the acronym wrong, but it's the North Atlantic Marine Environmental Protection Agency, I believe, uh, that they deal with shipping. Um, and climate change in their art contest. And then I have links more about the Argo floats and ocean currents and the rubber ducks and our conveyor belts. And then the, some more stories about the reality of something like the day after tomorrow happening in the future, which is all rooted in our currents slowing or stopping. Uh, so if you have a question, now would be a good time to put it in the Q&A or in the chat section on Zoom. And if you are on YouTube, I will answer those comments later on. Sorry, I can't be on both platforms at the same time. I'll just uh, give you a couple more minutes here to ask any questions. And if you can't think of one at the moment and something pops up, please feel free to email us or post something on Facebook and we will get back to you. Um, okay, so here's a, a couple coming in. Um, how fast do currents move species around? Um, great invasives. Currents definitely are moving. Uh, our plankton around, so on the surface. Uh, if you're a plankton, you go with the flow. So you are at the will of where those currents are taking you. Um, from what I know about invasives, 
more of them are coming from shipping traffic, so taking ballast water from one part of the world and bringing it to the other. But there are um, larger species like sharks that and whales that migrate over long distances, and I'm not sure how that moves invasive species or not. That's a great question. Uh, Uh, yes, this recording will be available on YouTube for whoever asked that. Um, so this is a, a good question about downwelling. Uh, and the question is, we mentioned that dissolved oxygen is brought to lower strata of the ocean, and but doesn't warm water hold less oxygen than cold water? You would think that O2 would be brought to the surface. Uh, the, answer that question is yes and yes. Um, so we have uh, some good examples of this in some of our past webinars when we we're talking about the solubility pump and the biological pump in the ocean. So yes, colder water holds more nutrients, which also includes oxygen, but we're we have down one is taking all the depleted water from the nutrient depleted water that has dissolved oxygen in it and is bringing it down to the ocean. So um, if we're following the deep ocean currents, uh, that water wouldn't have had anything when it's being moved away. So every, every time we move water from one place, we have to put it back in another place. How many species rely on the conveyor belt? I would say we all do because it's regulating the temperature of our planet. Um, and if we change the temperature dramatically, uh, it's gonna change our climate on our land masses. And if we change the temperature dramatically of our ocean, it's gonna change the density driven currents, which would then alter where all of our ocean water is moving and where those nutrients would end up and where our highly productive zones of the ocean would be. Um, so I don't see a lot of questions coming in at the moment. So just want to say thank you again for, for joining us. Uh, if I didn't get to your question, uh, please send it to us on Facebook or uh, via email. We are going to have more distance learning opportunities in the next couple of weeks. Uh, they will be posted on our Facebook page and via our email. Uh, so if you haven't subscribed to our email list, please do that as well. Uh, we have taken some polls on what we're going to cover in the next few weeks, and I think we're going to be talking about uh, the rocky intertidal zone and hydrothermal vents uh, in the next few weeks as well. Uh, thank you to everyone that has helped us keep these programs going. Uh, we are a small nonprofit and um, have lost quite a bit of programming due to school closures. So if you can support us, we really appreciate it and uh, stay safe out there. We look forward to seeing you soon.